Dr. Sam Malik is our speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Malik is a professor in the Department of Informatics at uh, ICS, Information and Computer Science at UCI. He's the director of the Institute for Software Research and Software Engineering and Analysis Laboratory. He's received a bunch of awards, far too numerous for me to fit on this page. Uh, one of them, the first one on the list was the National Science Foundation Career Award. And I just mentioned a couple of his affiliations with the ACM. Uh, he's on the ed editorial board of the ACM Transactions on Software Engineering and Methodology and the ACM Transactions on Autonomous and Adaptive Systems. And um, without further ado, uh, I introduce Dr. Sam Malik. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me, can everybody hear me? Or at least, can, Michael, can you confirm that you hear me? I can hear you. Um, let me try to uh, share my screen here. <clears throat> okay, so I think everybody should be able to see my screen now. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak um, at this event. Uh, I know we were, um, uh, you know, this was supposed to be a um, physical in-person meeting when we, when we set it up uh, several months ago and, uh, you know, the um, world has changed. Uh, so here we are. Um, you know, in, in some ways I feel like with these remote, um, you know, with Zoom based meetings, it is in some ways easier for people to just make it to these meetings because you, you know, you're home and you just uh, click a link and you can attend these meetings. On the other hand, there are certain experiences that are missed from not being able to, you know, interact um, in person. Um, so um, I will talk about um, some of the work that I've been doing in my lab um, on mobile application security. Um, I will present some of the sort of more the um, high level challenges um, facing um, application security, mostly focusing on Android. The title says mobile, but it's mostly really focused on Android. Um, and let me make sure I have the chat enabled here in case there are questions. Um, Okay, um, all right, and uh, so here we go. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, every, everybody is aware of the fact that smartphones have fundamentally changed computing. I have some stats to uh, go over um, as to just, you know, just the extent of it. Um, so uh, at least as of 2014, there are more mobile users than, than desktops and uh, laptop users. Uh, so that's no surprise. As of 2016, the great, uh, the, uh, as of 2016, most of the internet traffic is actually generated from mobile and tablet devices. Um, so that's uh, interesting. Uh, most of the internet uh, traffic, most of the e-commerce is happening over these, these devices. Um, and there's been explosive growth in mobile apps. So, uh, you, you know, you, you can imagine any kind of a functionality and you are presented with dozens of, of possibilities. You can go to your favorite app store, Google Play in this case, uh, or, you know, um, 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 you know, any kind of app store. And there are lots and lots of possible possibilities from, you know, from weather app to flashlights, you have lots and lots of possibilities available to you. And so these have made these devices, mobile devices, a lot more useful. Um, and so um, this data that I have here is a little bit old, uh, but at least as of a few years ago, a couple of years ago, there was about 3 million apps on just Google Play. And that number has continued um, to grow. The, um, the revenue generated by uh, mobile apps um, have also been growing. Um, so, um, you know, the expectation is that by 2022, so in a couple of years, um, the revenue generated from apps um, is going to top $800 billion. And so um, this, is, uh, this is a big industry. And so, um, you know, a few years ago, people used to talk about how future of software engineering is developing software for mobile devices. And, you know, I think that future has certainly arrived. So um, when, we, when we train our uh, students um, you know, nowadays, I mean, mo most of them are gonna graduate to go on to become mobile app developers, basically. Um, including the backend uh, potentially. So these, a lot of these are distributed systems. 
Um, but you can see here, so the, the revenue generated is been growing. And so wherever there is money, there are um, security concerns. So, um, you know, in parallel to the growth of a um, number of apps um, and the increase in revenue being generated by these um, applications, we're seeing an increased, um, uh, increased security problems. Um, and so this chart is showing the development of Android malware and you're looking at the total number of malware which is growing exponentially and the new malware um, at the bottom uh, that is also growing. And so this, this starts a little or also uh, added this other stats that I found um, that talks about a sort of trend essentially has been continuing. So you can see that, you know, up to last year, up to January, 2019, uh, these samples, um, malware sample, samples continue to grow. And there, there are organizations that essentially collect these so they can, uh, they can report these um, every, um, every once in a while. Um, so uh, Android, you know, in the mobile space, Android is the major player. Um, you know, I know a lot of people, uh, at least in, in, I guess, California, especially, um, a lot of people, most of my friends, including myself, have um, iOS. But in fact, worldwide, Android is the dominant um, player. So here on the left-hand side, um, you can see the market distribution. And um, you can see that, you know, roughly about 85% of the uh, mobile devices are running Android. Uh, and uh, the, on the right-hand side, you can see the attack distribution, uh, which shows that 98% of attacks are, are targeting Android. And that kind of makes sense because um, usually attackers, usually security um, attacks target the dominant platform. And so um, Android is the dominant platform here. And um, some argue that it maybe the security is not um, as um, tight as iOS. It is, it is mostly open source. Um, it is fragmented. Um, there's lots of, um, uh, lots of devices that support Android OS. And so because of all those potentially, um, there is just more vulnerabilities in the platform and there's just more attacks in, in targeting that platform. So my presentation today is mainly going to focus on Android. Um, I, I do. I will. I also note that most of the, in fact, research in mobile application security has focused on Android. Um, one of the reasons is because it's just easier to study the platform. It is open. Uh, it is significantly more open than iOS, and so um, there is really just a lack of studies targeting iOS. Um, it's it's unclear to me how much iOS is more secure than Android, if it is. Uh, because there's just not as much um, being published and done in, in that space. But anyway, my presentation today is also going to uh, focus um, on Android. Um, and so um, I'll start by um, looking at, uh, you, know, you know, why is Android so vulnerable? And, and, you know, we've been studying this for a few years and uh, there, are, there are various explanations for it. One of them is the fact that it is a dominant player. So obviously there's just more, um, more attacks um, targeting it. Um, but there's also some missteps in the way the platform itself has been realized, uh, at least missteps from the security perspective. Uh, these were potentially design decisions that guided the design of Android um, with um, other objectives, for example, for making it usable, for making it um, easier for developers to build applications that uh, have nice UIs and so on but don't necessarily uh, present the most, um, um, the most way of securing the platform, if you will. And so uh, the sort of the key uh, point here is that getting a framework, um, and by framework here, I'm talking about the Android development framework. So essentially, if you're gonna develop an Android app, uh, as a developer, what you have to do is you have to install um, the Android development um, framework, and then you build your application on top of it. So even though you're programming in Java, for the most part, you're really building your app on top of um, um, lots and lots of libraries and, and uh, services that are provided by the Android. And by that, uh, I mean, uh, so by framework, I'm referring to those libraries and services that you're building your application on top of. And so um, when Google designed this framework, they, um, they faced an exceptionally, exceptionally difficult task because um, at the very beginning, at least it was not very clear how successful the platform is gonna be. And uh, they've got a lot of things right, um, but there are also certain things that they've done which um, 
is which is questionable and which especially pose uh, security um, problems um, as we see it uh, right now. Um, so Android um, the, uh, has adopted what we call architecture-based development in, in software engineering. And what that means is that um, when you program in Android, you program in terms of architectural constructs um, uh, such as components. And uh, essentially you have to um, build your application in terms of some predefined component types provided by Android. Uh, so for example, the UI component, every user interface screen becomes an Android activity component. If you have um, a functionality to, for example, download music, that would be implemented as a service. Um, content providers are essentially lightweight databases that you would use for storing um, data in your app. And then broadcast receivers um, essentially support the pub sub um, communication model, uh, so for example, uh, the system itself is one of the broadcasters and if your application needs to lis listen to system events so for example if the device is running out of um, uh, battery or if there's a new wi-fi and so on these are system events that are being broadcast and you can have build your application to um, to receive those updates um, and so when when a developer wants to build an android application they um, are really confined to a predefined set of component types that they have to use for for building their application. And this is known as artificial based development, um, meaning that um, much of the design has been done for you and you're really confined to use those design idioms and constructs in the development of your app. Um, and so um, if you look at a typical app, if you were to look at the, um, if you were to reverse engineer the architecture of a typical app, it would look something like what I'm showing um, on, on this slide, um, you would, um, so each, so the folder here kind of represents the app and the components are the white boxes in there and the components most often um, communicate with each other through these things called intents and intents are essentially these messages that are being sent um, between components. And so you will find uh, a system that is highly event driven, um, driven by these intent messages. And it, it has, um, most apps actually have very clearly defined architecture um, consisting of these components, predefined components that Android provides um, for you. So this part actually is kind of exciting for a software engineering researcher because software engineering researchers have been advocating people to, um, to try to implement systems in this way. Um, it, uh, it results in clean designs and clean architectures and so on. Uh, so the issue is really not here. Um, the issue, um, and, and this, this is, of course, in Android, you can also have apps that communicate with each other. For example, in this case, one app is able to send messages to another app. So um, that's, for example, how you're able to have one app uh, invoke, for example, YouTube or bring the, or put something in your calendar and so on. So apps can also integrate with each other by sending these messages. Um, and so the um, issue uh, with Android really comes up with this um, principle um, known as principle of least privilege or least privilege um, principle. And so um, this is generally one of those principles that is a good principle that you want to adhere to in your architecture. And an architecture that, um, that um, is compliant with this principle is one where the software components in that architecture um, can only access um, information and resources that are needed for providing um, their functionality. So meaning that you only grant um, access um, to resources and, and data and, and other applications that are needed for the component to perform its function. And so it's called least privilege because you, that, 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 that is the amount of privilege that is needed for the component to function. Um, and the issue with Android is that the development framework, the way you actually build the applications systematically violates this principle. So in fact, um, the way the platform is designed is, is it promotes, I mean, it really requires the developer to really violate this principle. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. And there's in fact more that we could talk about, but um, I think these two will suffice. Um, one of them has to do with the way the permissions uh, work. Um, so this is what I call overprivileged resource access. Um, so when you install an Android app, um, what happens is that the app is gonna ask for some permissions. Uh, so let's say here we have two apps what I call an Android system. You can think about it as a bunch of apps installed on a phone. So here you have two apps indicated by the two folders and each app here is requesting access to some kind of a permission. Um, 
app A is requesting permission uh, for location. So that's what that icon is the location access uh, request. And app B is requesting access to um, text messaging services as indicated by the corresponding green icons that you see on the screen. Um, and so what happens is that uh, when an app requests access to some kind of a permission, by default, um, all components of the app are going to be granted um, that access. So if your application has, let's say, 50 components, and only one of these components needs to have access to your GPS uh, location, um, the way Android operates, the way development platform uh, works is that the uh, permission is granted to all components um, in the app. And so um, this essentially is a systematic violation of least privilege principle because you know, all components don't need access to, 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 to those permissions. And um, from, um, from a security standpoint, it makes it harder to evaluate and assess the security posture of an application because um, all components could potentially have access to that resource. And as I'll show in the case of dynamically loaded code, in some, in some cases, it could become pretty complicated to actually be able to certify uh, what parts of your application or to be able to have assurances about what parts of the application are actually accessing um, these resources. So this is the first issue, this overprivileged resource access. Um, the second, um, again, systematic violation of least privileged principle on Android is this um, thing called um, overprivileged intercomponent communication. And uh, you hear me using the word ICC throughout the presentation. Um, ICC essentially stands for intercomponent communication, and that's the intent-based uh, communication between um, apps. So by default in, in Android, apps with uh, components within an app can all talk to each other. And uh, so this by itself is not a great design, but it's probably not super critical in the sense that suppose the components within an app can be trusted. Um, but also by default, um, if, you, if your components define intent filters, which is the way you actually uh, allow components to talk to each other, by default, those intent filters are public, meaning that by default, unless the developer actually takes some actions, um, components can actually talk to each other. Um, components of different apps can also talk to each other. And so this is, this is problematic because um, essentially by default, Android is trusting um, other apps um, or the way the framework is implemented. The developer actually has to understand the security um, properties of, of the platform and take extra steps to make sure the components um, of different apps cannot be um, easily accessed. And so, um, these issues um, have led into um, a whole host of, um, of vulnerabilities and security attacks that are possible by exploiting those vulnerabilities uh, known as uh, ICC attacks um, or intercomponent communication attacks. And so um, we, uh, you know, we published a paper a few years back where we um, developed the taxonomy of, of these attacks. Um, and um, I will present a couple of them um, today, but there's actually a whole host of these um, there are dozens of these um, attacks that are um, possible. Um, so um, the first one is um, app uh, collusion. So um, the, uh, in the app collusion attack, you um, have, um, in the app collusion attack, what you have is you have two applications um, that are potentially uh, installed at different points in time. Um, but, and, and each of them individually don't um, pose a threat, uh, but when both of them are installed on a device together, they can do something that is malicious. Uh, so in, the, in this case, um, you have one malicious application that uh, requests access to GPS permissions, but no internet permissions. So to a user, this looks, um, this doesn't look like a malicious or harmful app because, you know, you know, if, if, all the app has access to is GPS and it's not able to, um, uh, is not able to share that information with uh, outside of the phone or other applications, then it cannot be that dangerous. Uh, then you have another application that doesn't have access to anything other than internet. And again, to a user, this might look benign or, or not harmful, but together behind the scene, the two apps actually communicate with each other. And, and so they essentially collude and they can essentially eavesdrop on, on the user. Uh, one app collects GPS, 
um, sends that information to another app, which then uses the intern permission to, um, to um, send that information out to the phone. Um, a second uh, attack that I will just, uh, again, I'm going, giving you examples um, to get a sense of what these IC attacks look like. Um, a second example is privilege escalation attack. Um, so here is where um, one, here's where we have a um, victim app, a vulnerable app uh, that have, uh, that has access to um, um, some security sensitive um, APIs through the permissions are granted to it. So in this case, the victim app has access to your text messaging or phone um, calling services. And you have a malicious app that doesn't have that access. And so uh, here you have a phone activity component in the victim app that is providing a public interface through an intent filter um, and fails to check if the caller has a proper permissions. And so the way Android expects you to implement systems is that if you're going to make one of your components public, and if that component is um, going to um, access um, or is going to invoke some kind of security sensitive API, and for example, in case of phone activity, then the developer needs to remember to perform some kind of a check. Um, once you receive an intent, you have to check to see if the sender of the intent actually has um, the phone calling permission uh, or text messaging permission or whatever the permission is. Uh, you have to check that before you actually go and make a sensitive API call. And so, uh, so the platform provides the capability of building a secure system, uh, but it turns out um, a lot of developers don't follow these. And you, you found widespread violation um, of these kinds of um, guidelines that developers are supposed to follow. And so in this case, essentially caller activity is able to send a text message, for example, by sending an intent message to a component that, um, that fails to, um, to, perform, um, to perform that check. All right, um, so um, I, I walked through sort of the, um, some of the security issues in Android. I talked about a couple of security attacks. Um, there, there are more, as I said, I, I, I won't, I'm not trying to cover all of them today. Um, the question is how can we solve these security problems? And there are generally two, um, two thrusts of research that are two approaches that are possible. And in my group, we've followed both of them. And so I will, uh, give examples of, of both basically throughout the rest of uh, today's presentation. Um, one approach is to accept Android as is. Um, so, you know, you know don't, don't try to change it because changing it is really problematic. Um, it, in particular, um, it could result um, in, um, in, 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 it could, it could really, um, it could really have an impact on the app ecosystem, right? So if you change the Android app such that the apps cannot run on it, so if you break the backward compatibility, um, it, can have, um, it, can, it can have serious uh, consequences. So the first approach is we, we accept Android as is, we try to develop tools to detect these security issues, um, essentially try to detect these mistakes that developers make in, in building their application. And the second um, approach uh, is to try to change the Android, but try to change it in a way that remains backward compatible with the existing three, four million apps that are, um, that are built uh, on top of it. So you don't require all these developers to go and um, reprogram or, or, or change, their, um, change their apps. All right, so uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, one research project uh, uh, with, with, within each of these um, thrusts. Um, the first one is accepting Android as is. So here we're not trying to change the platform. Uh, we're taking the platform for the way it is. Uh, you know, it, it, it has lots of Good features. It has security features that are implemented the way they are and result in certain weaknesses. And so the question is not to try to change the platform, but to actually help the developers with producing um, more secure applications. And so um, here, one approach that you could take is to um, try to essentially implement program analysis techniques um, for detecting security violations or, 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 or detecting um, mishaps in the way developers have implemented their applications. And so um, by program analysis here, I'm mainly talking about static program analysis. And so static program analysis basically means that you give me, um, you give me your code, you give me the app, uh, and I can analyze the properties about that app without actually running the app. So static, so without actually running the app, I will, I will have another piece of software uh, that runs through that uh, app and tries to find violations uh, such as some of the ones that I showed earlier. 
Uh, and so static analysis could either work off of source code or it could work off of um, bytecode. Um, everything that I'm going to show today actually works off of bytecode. Um, so we don't actually need the source code of the app. We can just do this off of the APK file, which is the file that is the installation package basically for Android app. Uh, but we do this without actually running the program. So the naive approach um, of this kind of a program analysis approach, a way of um, finding security issues in apps, is to think about a bunch of apps that you're going to have on your phone. And let's say the scenario here is that we're trying to um, assess whether a phone has vulnerabilities or not. So you have a bunch of apps on a phone. Um, and we can treat all these apps as one combined app. We can treat all these apps as one large program, or each app essentially is a component of the program. And we can build a program analysis tool um, or technique that tries to find um, these um, security issues, vulnerabilities that I, that I talked about. Um, the, the problem with this approach is that, first of all, it doesn't scale um, because um, users are installing more and more apps on their phones. Uh, and so, you know, it used to be the case that people had like 20, 30 apps, and now people have hundreds of apps on their devices. So it generally has scalability issues. Um, noting the fact that if you want your program analysis to be precise, it, it really takes a large, um, takes a um, significant amount of computation to build um, precise static analysis tools. Um, also because um, apps are being updated, um, being removed, new ones being installed. So if you try to do this very computationally expensive thing every time there's a change to an app because it was updated or a user um, installed a new app, uh, it really just doesn't scale. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, work. And so um, we, so the solution that we wanted to have here was, a, uh, was an analysis that could both scale and be compositional. And by compositional, what I mean is that uh, we want to be able to analyze each app in isolation. So we want to have to, we want to separate apps. Uh, that way we don't have to reanalyze um, all the apps on a device, for example. Analyze each app in isolation and then be able to then combine the results from um, all these individual apps to be able to uh, evaluate the security posture of the entire system, the entire phone. Uh, and so that's what the compositionality uh, means. And uh, kind of an insight that we had here is that we, um, we, um, we, the sort of insight that allowed us to do this is to be able to lift the analysis, is by lifting analysis to the granularity of the software architecture. So instead of trying to do the analysis of the individual lines of code, um, we would try to do that analysis, but then lift it to the architectural level. And I think it will become clear uh, when, I, when I present um, at a high level what the approach looks like. So this led into um, uh, to this work um, and tool called COVERT, um, which stands for Compositional Analysis of Interact uh, Vulnerabilities. Um, so COVERT is a formal, is, is, is a kind of a marriage of program analysis, static program analysis, and formal methods, which basically means that uh, it's a kind of a model checking approach um, together with static program analysis. Um, and uh, I will go over it at a high level without getting details of the formal methods here. Uh, to give you an idea of how the system basically works. Um, so um, we, well, the first thing that we did is we developed specifications um, that capture um, what it means to be an Android system. And so um, we captured these in the form of alloy models. You don't have to understand the alloy model that I'm showing here. I'm showing it just so you have a sense of what it looks like. Um, alloy is a formal um, modeling language. Um, it allows you to um, formally specify um, properties about your system. And so what we've done here is that we've formally specified what it means to be an Android application. Uh, so here, um, the signatures here represent the constructs, the components, intents, intent filters, all the constructs that you have in Android. Uh, you have fields that represent the relationship between these. And so this alloy model can be actually, it's a formal association, so it can actually be analyzed by a model checking tool, essentially a SAT solving engine. Um, to then be able to verify properties about your system. So that's the, um, the understanding that I want you to take away from this. You don't have to fully understand what the Allen model is doing here. Essentially, it's a, a specification that allows a SAT solver to then solve uh, satisfiability problems through model checking on, on your system. Um, so we built this. This was a manual effort. We've done this kind of a one-time effort. We have to update it um, every time Android has major changes to it, but that typically doesn't happen that often. Um, we've built program analysis um, a technique that uh, analyzes apps individually and extracts equivalent alloy specifications for the app. And so um, this component, basically what it does is that we 
what it does is it analyzes the um, manifest file that comes with an Android app. And so here I'm visually capturing what you're extracting from each application. So here I'm showing two applications. Um, you first uh, extract a bunch of artificial elements such as components, intents, um, you know, permissions, certain kinds of property that you can extract from the manifest file. Um, then we extract additional information by analyzing the bytecode. Uh, these are things such as intent and filter, intent filters that are defined in the code itself. Um, we extract um, event-driven behavior of each application. Again, all this is done automatically by the tool. Um, so for example, we know that when you click a button, what logic gets executed or when a component receives a message, what APIs get called or what behaviors um, transpire. Um, and we also identify sensitive paths in, in the components. So a sen sensitive path in the case of the phone activity here, um, highlighted in red, is indicating, for example, that when this phone activity, is, uh, when this phone activity receives an intent message, um, it eventually makes, for example, some kind of API call uh, that is security sensitive. For example, sends a text message or, or makes a phone call or, um, or accesses GPS and so on. So APIs that are essentially permission protected. Um, you automatically extract this through static analysis of, of the code. And in the end, the result of a static analysis is modeled in the form of um, alloy specification. Um, the, so again, these are machine interpretable formal specifications that could be then analyzed using the SAT solver. Um, and again, I don't need you to understand what these models are saying. Uh, the point here is that each application results in a separate specification. So if I, um, so, so if the malware application or if the victim application here changes, I don't actually have to analyze other applications. These are declarative specifications that are independent of each other. So they're declarative and therefore I can only um, analyze the app that has been updated. Um, and so that's the second component of covert. And then the third component is to model the um, vulnerabilities that we're trying to check. And so uh, an example of that is the privilege escalation attack that I talked about earlier. Again, I don't need to understand what the Allen model um, is saying here, but at a high level, what it's saying is that um, it, is checking, it is checking a privilege escalation violation, basically. It is checking to see if that, um, if that property, um, it, it is modeling a property that you're intending to essentially check um, in your system. So um, given these three models, an Android specification that is uh, essentially modeling the, um, the properties of your architecture uh, of, of an Android system, app specifications that are automatically extracted through static analysis, and assertions, which are the properties you're trying to check, you feed these into a SAT solver, which is indicated as a formal analyzer here, and the SAT solver is unable to detect whether any of those assertions are in fact satisfied. And in fact, what we're really doing here is a model checking. Um, we're, we can formulate this as a model checking problem. Uh, we're um, given an Android specification S. So S is the, um, is the um, Android architecture and how it behaves. Uh, app specifications M. So you have one or more um, app specifications that capture the behavior of your application and uh, one or more vulnerability assertions. Um, you're interested to see if M um, does not satisfy P under S. Um, and so if it does, then you've detected the vulnerability and want to report it. So this basically is kind of a model shaking problem. At the end, all you're doing is so solving a satisfiability problem, basically. And so if you solve that and you detect the vulnerability, as in the case of our running example, what you essentially have found is, uh, is kind of a vulnerable interaction uh, between, in this case, the caller activity component of the malicious application and the phone activity of the victim um, application. You've essentially found a path where um, there is a possible interaction between these um, applications that could result in the security, um, uh, that, that, can, that can have security implications, basically. Um, so, the, um, I've done a bunch of experiments with covert um, uh, in, one of, in fact, Covert is a tool that um, an eventual version of it, not, not this version I'm talking about, but a later version of it was actually um, used by DHS for a while uh, for vetting, um, uh, you know, Android apps uh, within um, a platform they have called Swamp, uh, which you can find if you Google. And so um, a version of this was actually being deployed there to, to vet um, Android apps and, and, and systems uh, within DHS. 
Um, but in this experiment that we published on, uh, you have a, we had 4,000 4, Android apps. Um, they came from four repositories. Uh, so they included some of the you know, popular apps in Google Play, um, some random apps, some malicious apps, and apps that came from, um, um, you know, from uh, other um, third-party app stores, if you will. And uh, we uh, partitioned this data set into 80 um, non-overlapping bundles. Each of them uh, uh, was comprised of 50 apps, essentially. At the time when we did this work, this is a few years ago now, um, the 50 apps was supposed to essentially represent typical number of apps a user would have on their phone. I think nowadays it's significantly more than that. But, uh, but imagine each of these experiments being essentially a device with a bunch of apps um, on it, with, with about 50 apps on them. And we ran the tools, so we found um, 385 vulnerabilities, um, variety of vulnerabilities. Um, I didn't talk about all these vulnerability types today, but uh, one of them I talked about was privilege escalation. So we found, for example, 36 instances of privilege escalation vulnerability um, in, in this experiment. And we um, manually checked these, um, and we found that the tool in general has about 61% 60, true positive rate. Um, and so what this means is that about um, half of what comes out of the tool, um, at least in these experiments, uh, was something that was, was actionable, was something that you actually wanted to go and fix because um, it, 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 was, it was something that uh, was problematic, so a vulnerability that was uh, truly an issue um, in, 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 in your system. Uh, we compared, okay, so um, the, we found some interesting examples uh, of, of security attacks that were possible here. Uh, this was one that we found. Uh, it was in a barcode scanner app uh, from, Buzz, uh, from App Bazaar, which is an um, app store from Middle East. And so here's an app that allows you to uh, essentially um, uh, uh, take a photo of a bill and I, I believe pay, pay for it through some kind of SMS uh, system that was available. And so the, it had a service that was exposed as an unprotected intent filter. And, uh, and so uh, essentially any app installed on the same device could potentially uh, make unauthorized payments through the SMS capability that was exposed on the app. So this, uh, this shows like some of the examples that we found were actually truly um, problematic um, security violations. Uh, we compared Covert to a couple of other tools um, that, um, that have tried to solve the same problem. Um, the Covert performs a, a lot, is a lot more scalable. It has a much better performance. And the main reason for it is that um, these other two tools, uh, Detail and Amandroid, uh, they generally follow the, uh, the approach of trying to treat or combine a bunch of apps together. They, they essentially try to build a large program consisting of all these apps to try to analyze them all together. The reason Covert is able to scale is because it is breaking that problem into smaller pieces um, and, uh, and it's doing this composition analysis. So Covert scales um, much better because it is able to analyze each app in isolation and then puts them together uh, through the SAT solving capabilities that come with the, um, that comes with the alloy, alloy analyzer that I showed earlier. Uh, so on the x-axis here, you have the number of components. On the y-axis, you have the amount of time it takes to uh, analyze applications, and you can see that. Uh, in fact, with some of these, for example, did fail, we couldn't actually run the tool for more than 30 components. So this shows that a covert actually um, um, scales much better than, uh, than these other techniques. Um, so one thing that covert uh, and, uh, and pretty much any other static analysis tool cannot handle very well is um, and, and, and it, this category of security attacks that are becoming more common, uh, and these are at, uh, attacks that are essentially done through what is known as dynamically loaded code. Um, so one of the things that Android allows um, is for an Android app to load code after it gets installed. Um, here, uh, the caller activity component malicious application is downloading some jar file um, external to the device. So it goes um, to some backend and downloads some jar file and essentially gains new um, behaviors that are not, um, that don't exist um, when, we, when, when we analyze the application. Therefore, a tool such as Covert or any kind of static analysis tool um, is not able to detect. So these are known as hidden code or dynamic loaded code. Um, and because the code doesn't exist uh, when you analyze the application, uh, you actually cannot detect um, these kinds of attacks. 
And so this is a kind of a limitation of, of, of this approach, which is something that we try to address in the other project that I'm going to um, talk about. Um, so the second project that I'll talk about is a kind of a, an example of a second category or second way of thinking about or doing things here. And, and so here what we're trying to do, so the first approach, we try not to change Android, rather we try to develop tools to help developers and security analysts to find security issues in, 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 in systems. Um, the second category is to try to actually change Android. So it's more of a, or what if it could change Android? And what if it could do it in a way that uh, it would not um, break the backward compatibility with existing apps? So for a change to be acceptable, um, the change has to maintain the usability of the platform um, because it's always easy to come up with a security solution that is just not usable. So we want it to be still usable. Uh, and also we want it to be compatible with existing apps. Uh, and the reason for that is, 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 is that you, know, you, don't, you cannot come up with a version of Android that, um, that makes all three or four million apps um, 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 essentially useless. And so so that, that, that is just not a possible solution. And so um, this, uh, to, 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 to address this, we kind of went back to the uh, whiteboard and asked ourselves, you know, what is the sort of the, uh, what is the sort of the mother of, all, mother of all evil in Android? And as I already mentioned, it's the fact that it's systematic violence and least privileged principle. And um, this figure here is trying to capture why this least privileged principle matters. Um, so this, and this is not specific to Android. Um, generally, a software system that is overprivileged is going to have a higher attack surface. It's going to have a larger attack surface than a software architecture that has a, um, um, you know, um, least privileged architecture, right? And so um, we wanted to see if we could actually address this issue of systematic violation of least privileged principle in Android. And um, one of the ideas that came to us is that what if we could build an analysis that could determine the exact privileges required uh, for each Android component? Um, so we would actually build a tool that would analyze the implementation logic of a component and figure out what privileges it needs to have um, for its functionality. So kind of address this after the fact. So try to not address it at the granting of the uh, permissions when the user installs the app, but rather try to limit it after the app is installed. And so I'll try to kind of sketch what the solution um, uh, looks like. Uh, you, you might remember this um, slide that I showed earlier, as I said, uh, one of the biggest issues with Android is that once you, is that when you grant um, a permission to an app, all the components of the app are going to have that permission. So for example, here in app A, you've granted the app the um, GPS permission, the location permission, and all of its components are automatically um, uh, granted that permission. And so um, what we thought about is that, well, what if we could uh, analyze the, the bytecode of these uh, components and figure out exactly what APIs are being called from these components. So for example, we could figure out that, oh, the reason app A is requesting the location permissions because component two in, in app A is calling get GPS API, which is an API that is um, security sensitive. It, is, it requires a permission to be able to access. And the reason app B is requesting um, text messaging um, permissions is because it has a component, component one, that is calling the send text API. And so, um, and we did that. So we built a static analysis tool. Uh, we first we developed a mapping of API calls to permissions. So we first figured out, um, actually we leveraged a prior work that had, that had systematically figured out um, exactly what permissions are required for, uh, for which API calls in Android. And then we built a static analysis tool that then analyzes the bytecodes of, of an application. And so um, even though when you install the app, it is granted all these permissions, what we could do is we could actually exactly figure out what components should have those permissions and, and only grant those permissions to those components. So we could actually automatically figure out from the APIs called by these components what permissions um, they need uh, for cooperation. And you could similarly do the same thing with this inter-component communications. Um, as you recall, I showed this slide earlier. Uh, one of the issues with Android is that um, you know, by default, components can talk to each other within an app. They can also, by default, talk to each other across apps. And developers have to take extra steps to make sure these communications are prevented. Um, but 
what we realized that we could actually build static analysis tools that would analyze the bytecode of components and resolve the intent and the recipients. And if you do this kind of a fine grained static analysis, we could then figure out exactly what are the interactions that are required within and across applications between components uh, for satisfying their functionality. And so um, given these two capabilities, um, we developed um, a tool called Deldroid, which basically uh, stands for determination and enforcement of least privileged artificial in Android. And at a high level, it, it works like this. You give us a, an overprivileged system, which is a default system in Android. It has components have access to all these permissions that they don't need. Components can talk to each other. Um, components have more communication capabilities than are actually needed. We start to analyze it. Uh, we figure out exactly what is needed for the components for the functionality that they have. Um, and whatever is not needed is what we call extra privileges, right? So there are extra privileges that we essentially don't need um, for, for this system to, to, for these components, for these, for these apps to function. And um, we built a custom version of Android. So we have our own version of Android where everything is basically the same except a couple of components that have been mon um, modified in the framework. Um, so there is a resource monitor and ICC monitor component in Android. Uh, we've modified those two components. We provide uh, these extra privileges as ECA rules, um, event condition action rules. Um, and so this Android framework then at runtime prevents um, all the um, resource accesses or communications that are uh, prevented uh, based on analysis. And what so the sort of the key contribution of this, or one of the nice thing about this is that all the existing apps that you're running on Android can still be executed uh, without requiring any changes to the applications. Um, the only thing that is of course needed here is that you would have to install our version of Android. So once you install our version of Android, which is again, slightly modified version of the kind of a, the open source version of Android, it's a small modification to it. Uh, you could still run all the existing apps on top of it um, because the changes are in the framework and they don't require changes to the application. And technically your components, your applications should continue to function the same because our analysis is keeping all those permissions that are needed um, for their functionality. Um, and so um, this would by default um, address the hidden code types of um, attacks that I talked about earlier. Um, so here you have the caller activity component uh, dynamically loading some jar file um, to, to, to then let's say launch some kind of a um, um, privilege escalation attack here. Um, since Deldroid is statically analyzes the app at the time of the installation, it actually does not allow this communication between caller activity and phone activity because it doesn't find that in the application logic of the caller activity when the app gets installed. Um, so this would by default uh, thwart these kinds of attacks. Um, of course, it has, a side, um, it has a side effect that if the app is downloading dynamic loaded code for um, benign purposes, for not malicious purposes, then, then it could potentially cause um, problems. Uh, then, then in those cases, the applications have benign behaviors that we're preventing basically. And we'll, we'll see that in, in some of the evaluation that we've done. Um, so uh, we, we did some experiments here um, to evaluate the approach. We uh, did 10 experiments with 30 randomly selected apps. We wanted to see how much of an attack surface can we reduce um, using this, using Delgroid by, by, by establishing this privilege architecture. Um, and so these are the 10 experiments with the apps. You can see some stats about the number of components involved. Um, so the approach uh, reduces the, um, the ICC privileges by 99%. So these are the co intercomponent communications. Um, that tells you that on average, an Android app essentially is, has 99% more privileges in terms of communications between components that it actually needs to function. And the reduce the uh, resource access privileges by 97%. So 97%, you can think about it, it's like 97% of components have privileges that they don't actually need to have basically. Uh, so this shows you just how grossly um, Android apps um, are overprivileged in terms of communication, in terms of accesses that are granted to them um, um, to, to the APIs and to the resources on their phone. Um, so this just shows how a tax surface can be reduced, but it doesn't still tell us how effective this reduction is in preventing attacks. So um, 
you know, obviously we're reducing the tax surplus substantially, but how effective is this in actually preventing security attacks from happening? And so for that experiment, what we did is we um, found a data set of um, 54 malicious and vulnerable apps. So these are apps with confirmed steps and inputs required to create an attack. And uh, the two types of attacks that are in these systems are uh, privilege escalation attacks, which um, I've talked about before, and the 20, and, and so you had 18 privilege escalation attacks and 24 hidden ICC attacks. Uh, so these are ICC attacks through dynamic um, loading of jar files and classes and so on. And uh, we uh, ran these attacks. We essentially tried to exercise these known attacks on uh, our version of Android, uh, on a Deldroid version of um, Android. And so what you see here is the uh, false negative, true positive, false positive. Um, so true positive is a good thing. Um, true positive means that there was a malicious behavior. There was a there was an attack that we were able to prevent uh, by simply proactively reducing the attack surface by establishing the least privilege architecture. Um, so uh, true positive is 42. So there was 42 attacks possible. We prevented all those attacks. Um, false positive is not good. False positive is benign behavior that was prevented. So this means that um, there was some communication or some resource access that was benign, um, meaning that it wasn't malicious, but we prevented it because the static analysis is um, um, generally over approximates the behavior, it's conservative, and so it has false positives sometimes. And so the moral of the story here is that this approach can, uh, apparently, at least according to experience we've done here, is very successful at preventing attacks but it has a side effect of um, potentially preventing some benign behaviors, which could be annoying, right? So there could be a benign application that wouldn't function um, because, because the approach just doesn't prevent certain API calls or certain communications to happen. Um, so uh, so that's, those are the sort of the two thrusts of um, research that, uh, that I talked about, sort of um, how do we, uh, how do we develop tools. Um, so, okay, let me just kind of recap using the slides that I have here. So um, I talked about the um, uh, sort of the root causes of some security issues in Android are the missteps in the, the way Android um, realizes this idea of architecture based development. Uh, I went over some of those. Uh, I talked about um, this category um, of attacks known as intercomponent communication attacks. These are attacks that are happening at the artificial level in the app space um, involving uh, components and messages and so on. I give a couple examples um, of those attacks. Um, and I talk about two thrusts of approach um, that you have followed in trying to mitigate these attacks. Uh, one was the covert project, which basically is a static analysis tool um, that is um, that, that static analysis plus formal um, methods approach of uh, trying to provide developers with better tools for detecting um, these vulnerabilities uh, without requiring change in the Android. And the second project I talked about was Deldroid. Um, and so Deldroid takes a different approach. It actually tries to change the way Android does things by modifying the platform. But its contribution is that it does this in a way where the um, existing apps can continue to run on this modified version of Android. So it doesn't require developers to go and modify their applications, which is, which is important. And it is a proactive approach of um, uh, going about security. So um, in, in covert, we detect them um, uh, you know, after they're found in the device. In Deldroid, we simply reduce the attack surface. And by reducing this um, to, by 99% or 97%, uh, by reducing this by such significant amount, we're able to proactively prevent uh, a, 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 at least all in, in our experience security attacks that were um, that were um, that were possible without it. So, so, so it actually is quite effective in kind of like a proactive way of reducing um, attack surfaces and attacks. Um, so, the broader takeaways from this work is that um, designing a new framework is hard. So, this talk is not intended to say you know um, Google did a bad thing or Android is bad. I mean, these attacks, um, these vulnerabilities exist in pretty much all frameworks, and um, most software is being developed on top of frameworks, whether it's mobile or whether it's web applications. Uh, there is really tons of frameworks out there. I mean, it's rarely the case that developers nowadays build software, um, you know, without some library or some framework. And um, the point here is that you know, designing these frameworks is very hard because you know it's very hard from the get-go to get everything right. 
uh, to build a framework that is usable, that becomes popular, that has all the right features, um, and at the same time is secure. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's a whole um, science there, you know, there, there's, there's a whole lot to be explored there from a software engineering standpoint as to how do you, how do you go about evaluating the framework? Um, in many ways, it's difficult because once the framework becomes popular, like Android, changes to the framework would, um, would make the app ecosystem become incompatible. And that's, so that's kind of um, the, the challenge there. Um, as a developer, you want to think twice before choosing a framework because um, in, in many ways, so in the case of Android, for example, most of your architecture, in fact, is decided for you when you choose Android. Uh, I mean, it really limits you to the kind of components that you can use. It limits you to the kind of interactions that you can have. And so um, when you choose a framework, you have, um, you've made a lot of decisions about your system. You've made a lot of artificial decisions. And also you've potentially made some decisions that affect the security of your system. Um, so the security of your system is only as good as the security that is um, the security design that is uh, supported by, by the framework. And so uh, in terms of our research, you know, in, in my group, we've been um, kind of applying this hybrid program analysis, software architecture, um, formal methods approach of, of, um, of um, detecting and preventing these um, security issues. And so that has uh, shown a lot of um, potential. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential for it um, beyond Android uh, and, and in, the context, in the context of other frameworks as well. Um, and uh, so I want to acknowledge uh, you know, various students, uh, other professors and colleagues, and uh, various sponsors. Uh, much of the work that I presented has been sponsored by DARPA and DHS. Uh, there have been other agencies that have also been supporting this work. And uh, with that, uh, I want to thank, um, thank everyone. And I'm happy to answer any questions I might, they might have. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malik. Um, we have a kind of a tradition uh, that our first question will go to uh, uh, asking about uh, participation from the IEEE Computer Society. So shortly, uh, we'll post uh, a poll uh, for that. And I'm hoping that if you are a member of the IEEE, uh, not just the Computer Society, but any, uh, any uh, facet of the IEEE, that you can respond to that poll uh, so that the IEEE, who's one of our co-sponsors, uh, gets an idea of how many, much of their membership are participating. So you should see on your screen now um, a poll that asks uh, if you, you are a current IEEE member uh, and if you could uh, indicate yes, if you are an IEEE member, that would be very helpful for us. So um, we had a number of questions. I've got eight questions right now in the queue. And I will go ahead and ask these questions of Dr. Malik. And uh, if you want to add a, add a question to the queue, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature. Uh, the first question comes from, um, let me make sure I got this right. Um, just made it disappear, so where's my Q&A? Uh, for, from, uh, John Joint, an ACM member at Norwich University, and uh, his comment is he's heard some security professionals are skeptical of the idea of using mobile application, a mobile application as a means of co contact tracing for the novel COVID-19 virus. Uh, would you be able to speak on this? Are there any concerns you would raise about user privacy or security? Uh, would you consider it to be invasive or generally a good idea? And before I let Dr. Malik answer, I do, do want to mention that our next presentation meeting is on uh, digital privacy. So Frank Uri will be speaking about privacy um, in our July meeting. Um, so uh, I will give D Dr. Malik an opportunity to respond uh, to this, uh, having given that plug. Uh, are there any concerns uh, about privacy or security in using uh, a mobile app for contact tracing for the COVID-19 virus? Um, so Michael, before I answer that question, is there a place where I can see the questions or is this something that I can... uh, yes uh, if you click on the Q&A which you should see at the bottom of your screen I see um, you should be able to pull up a list of the questions okay I just don't see this question there. it was the very first well I guess I dismissed the first one so it should be at the top of your list okay I'm having a hard time seeing it but I mean I think I mean I'll answer this um, 
yeah, I mean, I think I think there is there is there is a huge um, um, what do you call it? There is a huge um, um, with, without a doubt there is a huge privacy issue um, there, and so um, my understanding and, 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 and this is actually something that I've been interested to look into. Um, my understanding is that um, Apple and Google um, the, this kind of opt-in model, right? So the so the, the the user would, would have to kind of opt in to 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 be willing to to I guess um, share their private data and so on. Um, also, my understanding is that they're actually not developing the app; they're just providing an API that others can actually use um, that API. Um, but I mean, I don't, I don't honestly know much about it. But I mean, I, I I definitely agree and think that there is a privacy issue associated with that. Um, I personally think if you allow, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like it, it, this is one of those situations right now with the pandemic that maybe people are willing to um, forego some of the, some of some of the things that they would, they, they, they might be more accepting or be willing to have some, um, some of the privacy being violated if for the sake of being safe, but I, I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, there's a lot of, lot, lot, lots of interesting things to be discussed there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Albert Fatal. Um, his question is, he'd like to ask if it may be valuable or perhaps dangerous to encourage developers to consider integrating blockchain into uh, data telephony as a means for secure data transmission toward mobile security. Um, and I keep this question open-ended to your discretion as the technology is likely too new to have concrete answers at this time, uh, providing much modifications as the technology matures. So the question is about using blockchain to secure data transmission. Um, now, I, I gotta be honest with you, I, that, that is something that I haven't really um, 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 looked into much. Um, I, I would be interested to, to actually learn more about it. I, it is not something that I've looked into much. Okay. Um, before I ask the next question, I would like to mention that uh, our presentations are scheduled to go till 8.30. So um, we have about 12 minutes left, uh, just to give you an idea of how long it will last. Our next question comes from Madeline Bauer. It's a short one. And she says, uh, is this overprivileged access a bug or a feature in the Android OS? Um, so it definitely is not a bug. It, 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 it has been, um, I mean, it, the, the system has been designed intentionally in this way. And, and there, is, um, there is a good reason for it. So um, it, from, one, from one perspective, there's a good reason for it. You, when, when, you, when the user is installing an app, it doesn't make sense for the system to ask the user if individual components of that app should have privileges. I mean, that's just, to a user, that is just nonsense because if an app has, 50 components and now the app asks me if this component should be allowed to have the privilege that that kind of a model of getting the user input is just um, uh, not um, not not a solution uh, or it would just be kind of it would just not be usable so i think it it, it, it is it's kind of a usability versus security right i mean um, it, it, it 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 results in more usable systems uh, I mean, Android a few years back, they went from an install time uh, security, um, but they were, were install time security model where you would have to grant the permissions of installation of, of the app to a runtime permission model where the uh, app requests access to permissions at runtime. And that was a lot more, more effective because at runtime the users just have much more better understanding of whether it makes sense to grant that permission to the app, to the app or not. So I guess, the short answer to the question is that uh, I, I don't think it's a bug. It, it was intentional design, um, but one could argue it has security, security ramifications like what, what I talked about. So, um, you know, some of the solutions that I talked about, I think allows us to address, um, address those issues that um, come up because of that. Well, thank you. Um, next question comes from Mark Velasco. Uh, he says, formal methods haven't been too widely adopted in the industry to a great degree. Do you see this as a way to drive wider adoption or usage of formal methods and analysis? Um, I, th I think the reason formal methods have, not, I mean, uh, at least certain categories of formal methods have not been adopted because they, they have um, had scalability issues. Um, for example, SAT solving techniques and so on. Um, 
there has been a lot of advances in SAT solving technology that has made, um, made it, um, so for example, some techniques such as symbolic execution. So some people might be aware of that. Um, you know, symbolic execution is this kind of a um, formal approach of um, um, analyzing programs uh, where you um, take the um, conditions and guards in the program and you model as a SAT problem, you solve them that way. Um, it, it was something that was widely studied, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and then people just kind of stopped working on it because they thought it's just not scalable, it's not gonna go anywhere. Then sort of the, um, the uh, you know, the mathematical community and the sort of the, 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 that, that whole community made so much advances in, the, in solving these SAT problems that we have much more efficient and faster SAT, SAT solving algorithms. And so now a lot of those techniques are making a comeback in software engineering and in program analysis. So I, I do think that a lot of these formal methods techniques that at least were relying on SAT solving technology uh, solutions are making a combat and are being deployed um, um, nowadays in various settings. So they, they have become uh, more practical um, just because of the advances in SAT solving um, algorithms. Thank you. Um, next question comes from David Harnick Shapiro. Um, do you think that Deldroid will be included in any commercial Android? Um, I, I don't know. I would have to hypothesize about that. Um, I, um, I, th I think the challenge with something like Deltroid is, I mean, I, th I think a real solution here would be to have something like this actually incorporated in the um, open source version of um, Android. And, I, and I, I'm not really sure if that, that is something that will happen. I mean, it's probably unlikely, I would say. Um, Okay, yeah. um, next question comes from Michael Pope. Um, something that isn't talked about much with Android or iOS is that it's locked down so hard that you don't really control the phone and arguably don't own it. Uh, to get that, you would have to actually hack the phone. If it were possible to get root in a more straightforward manner, how do you think it would change this situation? Is it possible that it might be able to help and hurt at the same time? To be able to root the phone? Is that the yeah. question? Um, I mean, usually, usually I think the way, I mean, generally speaking, I think rooting a phone is more likely to result in more security problems for the phone um, than, than not. Um, but I do note that some of our techniques, so for example, Deldroid that I talked about, that pretty much does require to root your device because you have to install our version of Android, which basically requires you to root the device. Um, but um, I mean, it's hard to make it, general statement here, but I think uh, usually, usually I know um, a lot of um, um, telecommunication companies and so on, they have issues with, with, with their users, in fact, rooting their devices because of the security concerns. Yeah. Uh, the next question is really kind of a follow on. It comes from uh, Brian Saya. Um, can you think of a reason why Google would not consider integrating the features of Deldroid into Android proper? Um, Um, I think the, the main shortcoming of Deltroid, and it is my own work, of course, I would, I would love it if they do, but um, it is, is the fact that it would essentially, um, it's a false positive that I talked about at the very end. Um, so, it, so right now, the way that the, the, the system works is that it can prevent certain benign actions or activities, right? So, and that's a big problem. Um, basically, um, I imagine Deldroid would be more useful not for the general um, population, but rather being more useful for um, folks that want a really secure phone. So, so if, if there are, um, so if you, um, in, in the sense that if you have a phone that is, uh, so for, for certain organizations, organizations that want to make sure their users are using phones that are secure, Deldroid is gonna give you, give you more control over that and it's gonna give you a lot more um, trust into those devices uh, because you're preventing a whole bunch of stuff from happening. You're really locking it down uh, to the permissions and privileges that are, that are, um, that are possible, that, that are needed. Um, I, I'm not really sure if it would be a great solution for the general public just because um, it, it might prevent in some cases um, legitimate behaviors. Okay. That's, a, that's a shortcoming of, of that, right? Is that it, it rarely, I mean, sometimes it does have um, that and as, as we saw in, in, in one instance, it, it prevented benign behavior from happening. Um, 
you kind of addressed this early on, but a question from Ansel Tang. Um, would you compare iPhone framework on its security and architecture, on its security architecture to Android? Um, iPhone is is quite different from Android in, in, in its development framework. It, it, it doesn't advocate this is idea of architecture-based development the way Android does. And um, so, so I'm not 100% sure if all the things, that, I mean, most of what I talked about today is not going to be applicable to, to, to iPhone and iOS just because um, how different the platforms are. Um, and, I'll, and as I said earlier, um, iOS is just generally speaking a much less studied beast than, than Android. Um, there's been not many studies into, into not, not at least quite as much as Android into well, the various attacks there, but also in terms of the solutions that are available. Our next question comes from an anonymous attendee. Are there any vulnerabilities that are specific to certain Android devices? That is, is Samsung more susceptible than LG or vice versa? Um, so the, the kinds of attacks that I talked about today, these are all in the application space and mostly caused by the development framework, design guidelines and so on. Um, what I talked about today is mostly, for the most part, maybe all of it, is not really affected by um, differences in the, um, in the Android and the fragmentation of the platform. Uh, but some, um, some Android vulnerabilities and attacks are caused by device drivers and by the fragmentation of the platform. Uh, that is not something that I've dealt with much. And my presentation today really was at the application level, not in sort of the OS level and the issues that might come up there. We actually have another faculty at UCI, um, Ardalan, uh, who in fact focuses, uh, focuses on those kinds of more um, lower level um, device driver kind of um, uh, attack vectors. Thank you. Um, a question from Dan Whalen. Has there been any interest in your work from the Android developer teams at Google? Uh, has it had any impact on the current releases of Android? Um, so we have collaborations with Google, um, actually not, interestingly, not on the security sides of things. It's been mostly on the energy. So there's another thrust of the work that I do in my group on, on energy and testing of Android. Um, no, not, not in terms of security. And um, that could possibly just be because also I haven't really been in touch maybe with the right people at Google because, you know, the Google is a big organization. So um, I, I've had collaborations with Google, but not on the, uh, not on the stuff that I talked about today. Um, okay, next question. Um, just like static analysis revoked permissions, do you think mobile endpoint protection will be in demand to monitor what applications are doing? Can they really tap into that level of process? Um, I'm not sure if I fully follow the question. I think, I think the question is about um, um, the, um, the sort of um, the, 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 the solutions for management of mobile devices and so on. Um, I, I, I honestly just don't know too much about that domain, so I can't really comment on that. Okay. Um, a uh, question from Yu Chen Wei. Uh, can Deldroid fit for NDK module? How do the NDK thread analysis? How to do the NDK thread analysis? Uh, NDK? Yes. Um, I'm not sure what, what that implies. I don't know either, sorry. Um, you did answer this. Are there any specific types of benign action components that might take that Deldroid would falsely flag? You did say that there are a number of uh, false positives uh, that it, it does flag. Um, oh. Uh, and I think you answered this as well. What kind of phone do you use? I think you already said that you use a, an iPhone. I use an, I use an iPhone, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, um, we are at the end of our a lot of time. It is now 8.30. Uh, I know we have people participating from the East Coast. Uh, so thank uh, those people for, for uh, connecting in. Um, I know it is a bit frustrating. We had a, about 100 people on our call uh, and not, not being able to see each other kind of takes away uh, one of the core aspects of having a meetup, uh, one of the great things of meeting at Kenobi Martins was the ability to, to network uh, and to, to meet people and, and have informal conversations in addition to talking to the panelists. But um, 
and again, I don't know how we, uh, we acknowledge uh, the great presentation of our panels. I really enjoyed learning about things like uh, app collusion and uh, privilege elevation, uh, very cool stuff. But um, in our own way, uh, let's perhaps through the chat, you could uh, indicate your, your appreciation for uh, the great talk that uh, Dr. Malik gave us this evening. And um, I would like to mention that our next presentation is uh, going to be on July 15th. And that is uh, by Frank Urey. that will be on personal privacy. Uh, there were some privacy related questions here tonight. I'm sure it is a, a, something of interest to a lot of people and it, it is gonna be you know, closely connected with uh, um, how we deal with uh, the health concerns due to the, the, the COVID uh, crisis that we're experiencing right now. So again, um, on behalf of the Orange Cap County chapter of the ACM, uh, thank you, Dr. Malik, for your presentation. And for all of you out there, um, please stay safe. Thank you very much.